Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Tamor Nabili from Channel News Asia, and I'll be facilitating this panel on agricultural <coughs> transformation today. Nice to see you all here. Two years ago almost, I was hosting a similar panel in Doha at the COP Climate Change Conference, COP18. And one of the interesting things at that conference was how little agriculture came up in the entire conversation. And the sense I got there from the people at COP was that this subject was just too big and too complicated to include in their agenda because there was so much else to talk about. So I come here, and yesterday I was um, at some of the events that WEF was holding with regard to their um, food development agenda, and I began to recognize exactly why I didn't hear about it at COP, because it is immensely uh, complicated and immensely difficult to deal with, and it deserves its own um, treatment, which is why WEF is doing such a grand job of doing this and why it seems to be accelerating up the global agenda. But what we're hoping to do here today is maybe translate some of that urgency into the broader mainstream audiences, the people who only all they know about food and agriculture is when they go into their supermarket and pick it off the shelf and take it home. Let them understand what the challenge is. Yesterday at one of these panels, uh, a representative from the WWF put it in very, very stark terms. She said, our challenge is we have to provide more food in the next 40 years than has been made in the past 4,000 years. And I thought, I wonder how many people out there actually understand that as one of the real things that we're trying to achieve here. So in order to maybe broaden this discussion and make it relevant to the broader uh, global audience, we're going to try and put some of those elements into context and describe the scope of the problem and perhaps some of the ways in which we can start solving it. And with me here to do that, I have a very distinguished panel. Allow me to introduce them to you now, uh, and we'll get on to the conversation. I'll begin from my left. Khao Duc Phat is Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development in the government of Vietnam. Estrella Penunia. Secretary General of the Asian Farmers Association for Sustainable Rural Development in the Philippines. Frankie Wujaya is, of course, with Sinar Mass. You probably all know him, Chairman and Chief Executive of uh, Sinar Mass Agribusiness and Food. Mr. Ho Sing Chan, Group Managing Director for ASEAN of DuPont, coming to us from Singapore. And at the far end, Robert Ziegler, Director General, International Rice Research Institute of the Philippines. Thank you all for participating in this situation. I mean, there are, there are so many aspects of what's been talked about already as to the challenges involved. And we have a good representation here of people from the private sector, government, and of course, um, from the civil society. So let me begin, if I could, with you, Estrella. Uh, and let's take it to ground level. Everybody is looking to the world of farmers now and saying, OK, the challenge is for the farmers to produce more food than they ever have done. And in the West, we've already seen that process turning into commercial agribusiness. In Asia, obviously, the challenges are entirely different. The land ownership, the production, the people involved, a completely different demographic. So from your perspective, just give us a little bit of background on how the farmers' experience is right now and how they're looking at the challenges that have been brought up here. OK, thank you very much. Uh, for, for me, the challenge is not only to produce more food, but to produce in such a way that I can earn from what I produce. Okay. So I have a farm, okay, and uh, it's an upland farm. It's a two-hectare farm. And uh, I, plan to, I have planned to produce uh, vegetables and fruits in a sustainable, organic way. Okay. But I don't have title to the land, so I cannot get loan. Okay, uh, I have a partner farming family and they do not know the technology for organic agriculture. And then we don't have link to the market. So we, some buyers come to our village and uh, they, they get our produce at a very low price. But when we look at the market in the nearby town, the price of our produce is like triple or four times. Like that. So this is uh, my concern as a farmer. So to produce food, we think, yes, we have to produce more food. But the challenge is also how to produce it in a more sustainable way. Because we experience drought, for example. We experience uh, less water in our farm. So how do we do? How do we produce with all these uh, climate shocks? If there was a farmer here, I don't know if there are any farmers from the Philippines or elsewhere around Asia in the audience today. 
Do you think they'd be looking at this panel and the other events that have been going on and saying, I see a support mechanism here, these people are addressing my issues, or do you think they'd be completely bewildered by what this conversation and saying, look, how does this affect me? I think looking at, I have the Secretary of Agriculture here in the Philippines, I think the government has uh, lots of support already for, for farmers who want to, for example, go into sustainable agriculture or even in agriculture, for example, do you have the extension, you have the <coughs> research institutions, you have some kind of financing. The challenge, for example, for small farmers, no? for small farmers is how to access, how to link to your, to your services. That's why the challenge for us is also how to organize ourselves into clusters or into groups or organizations so that as a group we can better claim or we can better access your services or we can better negotiate with some of the private companies who are dealing with the farmers. Are you getting enough help though, either from government or from the private sector, in meeting those challenges? Do you think that the amount of effort and the focus that's being expended is appropriate? Okay. In some areas, yes, when we are more organized, but in some areas, no. Okay. What, what, in our, what would be the, the, the areas that you would want to see more action on? Uh, we, see more, uh, we, see, we want to see more action in terms of information dissemination, for example, with regards to the government services that they have. We want to have more in, in terms of extension work. We want to have more on relationships and partnerships between government and between private uh, companies in terms of what we can do together for production and for marketing and for food processing. Let's, let's get a perspective from the other end of that spectrum, from government. Minister Fath, just describe to us, if you would, the, the, the priorities for the government in Vietnam, how you see uh, the situation in context of what, what Estrella has described as her experience. Uh, when uh, in Asia, in Vietnam, we have uh, mostly uh, small farmers uh, producing uh, most agricultural uh, produces uh, and the main task for any government is to assist uh, farmers to raise their productivity uh, and uh, in order to be successful uh, from our experiences, I mean, in Vietnam, uh, I think that first we need very strong commitment from the government. Uh, and then secondly, uh, we need to work out an urban policy environment to encourage farmers, uh, businesses, and own partners involved to work together effectively. And thirdly, we need to invest more in agriculture. First of all, to improve uh, infrastructure and in international uh, aspect, I think uh, we need to work out stronger uh, cooperation, more uh, free trade that would assist also farmers in every country. The infrastructure component of what you're doing and the preparation, I suppose, for the need for greater efficiency. That, to just explain to me what Vietnam sees as its priorities in these regards, uh, particularly when you consider the issue of climate change and things like that. Just um, how much priority is being given to the planning for agriculture and the challenges ahead? And how much are you just trying to organize the basic uh, I guess, framework of your agricultural industry first? Uh, when uh, Vietnam is forecasted to be uh, among the five the worst affected by climate change, and in order to uh, adapt to climate change and um, participate in international effort of mitigation, uh, we are uh, um, uh, working on plan uh, to adapt uh, country as whole, and first as own agriculture. Uh, and as agriculture will likely uh, will be um, affected strongly, and 
And in terms of uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, we, uh, we plan and carry out measures in such a way to uh, facilitate higher productivity nowadays, but also to aim at future uh, adaptation. So I mean that we, we, we have integrated plan. Uh, and most important in uh, Vietnam nowadays is to improve uh, irrigation uh, system and uh, including uh, not only uh, reservoir uh, to store more water, but also dike system, first as on sea dike uh, system. Okay, so we've set the framework there, the spectrum. Uh, at one end, the farmers on the ground, at the other end, the government making policy. When we come back after this short break, we'll talk about what the middle ground has to do about this, the commercial operations, the civil society operations. We'll take a short break first, back in just a moment. Do stay with us. <laughs> Sorry, that's the TV element of the whole process. Okay. <clears throat> we'll start again. Okay, welcome back. We're talking about uh, the challenges now of trying to solve the issues laid out uh, by our first two guests. And uh, let me uh, come to you, Bob Ziegler, about just how you see the, that broader environment, not at a nation level, but at a scientific level. Your research institute is obviously concerned with these things. Well, at, this, at the scientific level, there's, uh, I think, both tremendous challenge and tremendous opportunity. You know, we, we know that the uh, the change in climate will throw at us some, some major challenges for our, our crop productivity. This would be droughts, floods, uh, seawater intrusions, salinity, et cetera, probably changing pest dynamics. Uh, but the, the upside is that we have uh, at our disposal a tremendous array of new tools that are, that are becoming available. Our understanding of molecular biology, genetics, uh, this whole biological revolution uh, will, will, will allow us to develop uh, crops that will withstand the, the onslaughts of climate change. Likewise, revolutions in communications technology, satellite imagery, all of these will allow us to get real world pictures of what's happening in the farmer's fields. Mm -hmm. Get information to farmers. Um, uh, I think Estella mentioned the, the need to for farmers to have access to information, to be able to make timely decisions. Uh, they become better credit risks, uh, if that's the case. So I see bringing together uh, the scientific tools uh, enabled by policy uh, changes that will, will allow farmers to, previously landless farmers, to participate in the market much more effectively. Um, uh, and changes in the ways in which farmers access information as being instrumental to transforming agriculture. And I think what we, what we really need to be thinking about is, is growing the rural sector. You know, what are the tools that, that make life in the rural areas attractive? Uh, how can they make, you know, you're not going to get farm productivity increase unless, unless people are making a better living. But, but I think but we let, have the tools. Let, let me focus for a moment though on, on that interaction, that interface between the science that you were talking about and the, uh, the farmers on the ground. How good is that communication process? To what extent uh, do farmers, I guess, trust and understand the science that you're offering them in terms of how to use pesticides and to what extent, whether the new kinds of seeds that you're offering them are actually going to benefit them rather than costing them more money? How does that communication process work? Well, that's, that's one of the big conundrums. Uh, we had extension systems that were designed during the 60s and 70s, in many ways modeled after the US experience of the 40s and 50s. Uh, that system is broken down. Uh, we need to develop uh, the messages regard, related to the technology n using new communications tools that we now have. Every farmer's got a cell phone for all practical purposes. Getting those messages in a way that farmers can, can understand them and getting them to ad, uh, adopt the technology and have the, the technology, once it's adopted, result in a mechanism that farmers actually can participate in the upside of taking a risk 
and not only on the downside. So I think that's this getting the, the risk equation right with farmers is important. And that's going to be a, a combination of technology, information that allows the adoption and, and, and execution of a technology, and a market that will be receptive. Well, let's bring Hosing Chan in on this, because your company, to a certain extent, is part of that interface. You provide some of the technology, you deal with uh, the industry in a way. Give us your thoughts on, on that interface and, and what technology offers, uh, and if it's doing it right. <coughs> Yeah. First of all, I think uh, from a, a DuPont is a science company, and we spend two billion U.S. dollars per year on technology, and about 60 percent over of that is connected to food and agriculture. So we're very much, uh, uh, in fact, we we do collaborate with ERI as well in uh, rice research in, in technology. So if I could uh, uh, kind of step back a step and say, uh, our company is. Uh, Noticing, noti noticing the, uh, these major changes uh, in, in the coming 20, 30, 50 years. And we see the population growth going forward towards 9 billion over people by 2050. And coming with this population increases are the increase in demand on food. Um, alluded in the uh, film earlier, is 60% or 70% increase in food is needed over this period of time. Um, and we believe that even the dietary uh, change, i.e. more consumption of meat and more consumption of eggs and all, all that, is going to place an additional demand on crops because we use crops to feed the animals. And, and so demand on crops will continue to be perhaps even higher. So the question is then, how do you solve this issue of much increase in demand over this period of time? So you can think of first, maybe we can increase the arable land, and we can maybe open up more new lands. But the, the data shows that the arable land on Earth is approximately 1,540 million hectares. And in between now and 2050, there's no more land. There's probably 80 million hectares uh, uh, left to be, to be had. So that's 4 to 5%. You can say we want to, on the same plot of land, plot more plants as a, a way to solve it. But that doesn't solve the problem. It probably contributes, again, 4 to 5% of the need. So over 90% of the need of the increased food production are going to come from increasing yield. Now, the factors that are against this would be twofold. One, urbanization, as cities go urbanized, they actually want to use more land for urbanization purposes. And they also attract many people from the farm sector into the cities for <clears throat> industrialization. So that goes against what we are trying to do here in terms of producing more food. The second thing is also a very important factor. That is that uh, I hear uh, yesterday that there are uh, 57, age, uh, age 57 is the average age of the Philippines farmers. And so we are having some challenge of getting younger people coming into the farm sector. The, the children of the farmers are reluctant to be farmers again. So those challenges continue to place stress on our ability to produce more food. So what are the solutions? Well, well um, let, let, me, let me just stick with the problem for a sec, if we could. I mean, do, sure. do you, um, as, a, as a, a science company, view the problem as a, as a technological challenge, a matter of carving up numbers of people, amounts of land, yield per acre. Is, is, it, is it a scientific and mathematical issue, or, or is it a broader issue? To what extent do you focus on the, the, the pure data and the people involved and the, and the various constituent parts of that organization? Yeah, as, as Timor, you alluded to earlier, this is a very complex, big issue. And we as a company, as a private sector company, does not have the solution to everything in this issue. The part that we can contribute to are <coughs> fairly limited. They are involved in, first and foremost, science, because we are a science company, and we believe that we can do good science to solve some of these problems. Uh, in other areas that we can do good would be to educate the farmers. We see farmers are the key ingredient of making this happen <coughs> for the future. And most of our strategy, if you will, around uh, uh, various uh, countries and geographies are uh, farmers' education. 
and we need to be able to reach as many farmers as we can to impart on them the knowledge of farming and the knowledge of technology. And the more knowledge they gain, the more money they can make, and the more sustainable they will be, and the more young people are going to be stay in the farm sector because of that financial incentives. All right. So they are all interlinked. Now, let me ask Frankie to, to address this issue as well. I mean, your business is all about interacting with people on the land. Well, what are the challenges involved there? How, how do you frame this conversation? Yes, um, thank you. Well, uh, as we inventorize the problem and the potential, the problem, as, as you mentioned just now, that in for, next 40 years, we need to produce as much as what we produced uh, 4,000 years, last 4,000 years. And we have about uh, 300, over 300 million smallholders in Asia, uh, out of the total uh, 400 over million all, all over the world. And these smallholders basically are the most vulnerable one. They are independent farmers. They are all what we are discussing here, the technology availability, the ICT, is not being given uh, the right time, the right uh, and they, do, they don't have that sophistication to adopt this. So thanks to actually uh, World Economic Forum to introduce new, new vision for agriculture, which address about uh, the food security, economic, uh, what you call it, uh, opportunity, and the uh, environmental uh, issues environmental sustainability. So these three actually can be uh, all come together with the uh, model that we have already uh, introduced in Indonesia, uh, so-called Partnership for Indonesia Sustainable Agriculture. So the, the platform that we form is like an association uh, with very good uh, guiding principles and, and very good discipline. And the focus is basically on the, uh, we allow working group from uh, private sector to lead, uh, including uh, leading these this, uh, smallholders, and certainly the government uh, is back up, uh, involvement is very, very important. In case of Indonesia, our uh, minister has been uh, very much involved uh, uh, to, the, to the ground to solve the problems. And helping to put the policy right, uh, to change the policy to su support this initiative. So the, the, the whole idea is how to make sure that all those uh, good things, including capacity building, will be done in modular basis. Modular means that, like McDonald's, you find all the solution there, including uh, good agriculture practice, uh, making higher yield, uh, how to get in, get the, uh, the, the financing, which is uh, even, let's say, the government is saying that, please give the financing to them. But the people on the branch, they don't want to give because they, they do not know yeah. whether they can get the money back or not. So uh, out of those instructions, about 3 to 4% only been been given out uh, to, the, to the farmers. So this is a very good solution, uh, uh, what we have, the Pisa Agro. In the beginning, I was very pessimistic, but now we have already about uh, 11 working group in Indonesia. And I think this, this, uh, this uh, working group is working very well. And we have, uh, every quarter, we have all this working group presenting their, their, their progress in these three, three matters. We said 20, 20, 20. 20 in increasing in yield, 20 uh, increasing in uh, the, the, uh, the income of the farmers, and 20% is reducing of the uh, emission. Now, th that prioritization uh, of, I guess, outcomes is a very important part of policy setting uh, and something that really needs to be addressed because I'm sure that different people have different ideas of what those priorities should be. Let's uh, put that on hold for a moment. We'll take a short break and come back and talk about that in just a second. Ready? All right. 
Welcome back. Let's talk about the priorities involved in setting policy for the future and, uh, within the context of all the challenges we've described. One of the things that you mentioned just before the break there, Frankie, was the number of small holders of farm. And I just want to talk about land distribution for a second because the idea uh, of yield improvement has surely got to be rooted to some extent in size. Commercial agribusiness is the most efficient production method that seems to be out there, and yet in Asia, uh, the average farmer holds a very, very small piece of land. It's very disparate. Do you see a future for greater consolidation of production, of land, uh, of farming effort, or is Asia going to have to find a way, a unique way of, of solving that issue? Well, uh, yesterday we have the full day of uh, the starting off of the Grow Asia, uh, Grow Asia Agriculture Summit. And thanks to the uh, secretary uh, uh, was very uh, hosting this, this uh, event. And basically, uh, we have a um, uh, few examples that uh, from the Philippine points of view, they, they have, uh, we, we learned something that they have small, uh, what you call it, uh, uh, the, the farmers holding small, small uh, farm, but they get it aggregated together, it becomes like an enterprise. So they, they aggregate like 10 hectares, 15 hectares, and they can consolidate all those ideas, all those uh, agriculture, good agriculture practice, uh, and make it into, uh, into the one smaller uh, enterprise. Uh, in case of like Indonesia, we are, we are doing this uh, from the cooperative point of view. So, in, for example, in palm oil, uh, we have planted 9.2 million hectares in Indonesia, the whole Indonesia. We're number one in, in the world for, for production. Out of that, 43% is smallholders. And half of that is about 2 million hectares. is independent farmers, so-called independent farmers. They just plant without any supervision. So their yield is very, very low. Uh, one hectare normally is about five to six tons, uh, six tons per hectare, and their yield is only two hectares. So, <clears throat> so we are trying to uh, uh, introduce so-called innovative financing to help these farmers to replant. Uh, but to replant, we need to make sure that uh, they are under the one cooperative, few families which have two hectares each, under one cooperative, so that the cooperative can, uh, we can give good agriculture, agriculture practice. We can, uh, uh, as, a, as a, what you call it, a big uh, company, we guarantee the loan. So that the, let, let me stop you there for yes. a minute, because the, the whole financing issue, yes. obviously very key, <laughs> keeps coming up in all these uh, conversations that we have. So we'll, we'll give that its own time for a second. But let me, Estrella, ask you for you, your perspective on that relationship with the farmers and, and uh, what we've been talking about here. Yes, actually, I would like to respond to your question about the land consolidation. Our collective thought uh, for, for us in the Asian Farmers Association, we need to organize ourselves into clusters Classes. commodity associations or commodity or cooperatives because the cooperatives either production cooperative marketing cooperative or multi-purpose cooperative they will be our vehicle our instrument so that we can uh, do production enhancement we can do linkage to the market we can do food processing and value addition to our products. And we need the support of government in terms of policies for, for cooperatives, incentives for cooperatives, incentives for social enterprises, especially led and directed I mean, by farmers. The, these, are, these are the issues involved. But have you seen such a cooperative model working somewhere? Is there, is there a template? Yes. Yes, there is. In, in the Philippines, uh, I always tell this inspiring story of a cooperative in Bicol, uh, one of the most awarded uh, agrarian reform cooperatives. So they started without land. The government awarded them land through the Comprehensive Agrarian Reform Program. They started to do land. They, they planned about their, how to use their 800 hectares of land. There was about 600 farmers in this cooperative. And now they are into, uh, they are the biggest supplier of organic rice in the market today and they have earned millions of pesos for from their biofertilizers from the chicken dungs that they have been raising 
Minister, let me ask you from a government perspective, though. I mean, how do you consider the question of land use and the question of trying to increase yield while maintaining some fidelity to farmers' interests? Uh, when land is the most important uh, issue for any farmers, and likely in Asia, in Vietnam, many Asian countries, we are going to have small holders for a long time. Long time yes. uh, even uh, in industrialized country, uh, you uh, can see also there are many small holders. Uh, so uh, our task is to assist farmer to have clear uh, right we plan uh, so that they uh, can be sure in making investment, long-term investment, and so that they could use land titan to uh, borrow uh, uh, credit from uh, banking system uh, and, and et cetera. Uh, and we have problem how to promote large-scale commercialized production with small holders. There is some way to do so. Uh, that, that is strong cooperation uh, uh, between farmers and uh, businesses. Uh, in Vietnam, we are carrying out a program, so-called creating large uh, field uh, owned by small holders. Uh, but I, uh, uh, I also ag agree with uh, speakers uh, uh, that it's very difficult for businesses to work directly with many, many uh, uh, small holders. Uh, we need someone in between to assist both farmers and businesses. And this, is, this is an issue that's come up a lot. I mean, institutions that can sustain and manage dialogue between the interested parties appear to be a key from everybody's perspective. Um, why, why do those institutions, why are we having to talk about that? Why do those institutions not exist already? Uh, um, I think that uh, uh, we have good idea, but uh, another problem is to carry it out. Uh, in order to, uh, to have it uh, effective, first we need to have stable uh, organization. Farmers' organization, uh, not something uh, for a very short time. Uh, that's why uh, it needs an urban policy, uh, environment, legal framework, uh, enforced uh, legal framework, uh, and also a lot of uh, attention uh, organizing effort from government side. I was uh, going to, to uh, say that uh, we actually have a, a program in Vietnam, in the Tan Hoa province, where uh, we work with the smallholder farmers into gathering into a larger plot. In fact, it was a, it's a two five hectare plot of land where we are introducing uh, new hybrid rice seeds into the community. And we are working with the farmers in that community uh, to uh, introduce a good agriculture practice, planting those uh, rice seeds, new rice seeds, and then uh, hopefully it will uh, grow at the, at the much better yield than previously. In fact, this program is ongoing and uh, it will be, uh, uh, we will see the harvest uh, within next month. Mm -hmm. So Fantastic. that's a good example of us continuing to engage with the smallholder farmers aggregating into a larger lot, <clears throat> allow them to use mechanized equipment to plant the, the, the seeds. Oh. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that's a, an excellent uh, uh, point to, to, to observe that when we look at these programs that are helping farmers consolidate and, and go into larger management units that may or may be more efficient, we have to make sure that the interests of the investor is aligned with the interest of the farmer. Because there, there can be, I can imagine situations where um, 
an investor may come in, may come in, it could be a seed company, it could be a pesticide company, fertilizer company, whatever, that could have short-term or medium-term interests that may in fact not be compatible with the longer-term interests of the productivity of the system. So I think when we look at that, at those models, and I think we have to explore those models, we need to make sure that, that our interests are, are, we're aware of them and that, and that they're aligned. I think, I think another opportunity uh, for the development of these areas that are populated by smallholders, I think there's a real opportunity for uh, novel entrepreneurship, where it's that, that space between many farmers and a few outlets, that there's a space in there that can be filled by ag services companies that are, that are taking advantage of the newest communications technologies that aren't stuck in a past model of extension of, of research results or, or what have you, but in fact are creating a new business model for the rural sectors. And I think that is going to be a, a, a key success to, to driving the change in these, in these rural areas. It'll be a bit like how the cell phone revolution <coughs> completely supplanted the landline industry. And I think we're looking at that kind of rural revolution. All right, well, talking about change in business models might be a good time to introduce this idea of financing change, options <laughs> to make life easier for farmers and producers and the businesses uh, that are attached to them. So let me throw this out as a general question to the floor. Anyone want to weigh in on this? Are banks serving the, the interests of the subject we're talking about adequately? If not, what should be done about it? Anybody? <laughs> well, uh, if I may, uh, this is why, uh, again, this Grow Asia, the platform is very uh, important. Uh, as many of the companies like DuPont and many other uh, NGOs are doing a lot of good things, this platform provides uh, the, the, uh, the place for people to talk and to find solutions. And the solutions are on the ground where the farmers are. So the farmers, we need to work the, using the working group as what we, the model has been uh, proven to be uh, progressing well. So all the good ideas will be there, and we address all the, 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 the problems. So uh, like the banks, why they don't want to give the loan? So we address that. So if we, as the big uh, corporation, we link to, to guarantee that because we are coaching these this farmers, uh, we make sure that we deduct some of those income before, uh, mm. for the banks. And then uh, if we have also working with the insurance, like Swiss 3 yesterday we discussed with them, how to insure if there's any crop damages from the extreme weather. So all those components will be put into so-called a modular. So we, we create that as a modular, and then we can duplicate that and, and uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, expand that, that model. Minister, what, what does the Vietnam government think about I, I remember that in yesterday one of the Philippines uh, agricultural ministry representatives was saying what we're trying to do is cut out uh, the practice of farmers having to turn to middlemen for usurious loans uh, in order to try and stop uh, income leaking out into, into financial transactions. What's Vietnam's view on, on trying to finance the smallholder? Uh, in Vietnam, uh, we are trying very hard to provide credit to farmers. And uh, the volume uh, of uh, credit has been increasing very uh, fast. That have very strongly developed agriculture for last uh, almost three decades. Uh, but uh, when we uh, talk to farmers, many still say that they need more credit. And then uh, we are trying to uh, assist both farmers and banking system to meet and to work out a better scheme. And I think that first, why the bank are reluctant to provide credit to farmers? Because uh, there is very high risk. Uh, to deal with many small holders, uh, and agriculture is risky business. So the gov what government should do, 
One is to take measure to uh, reduce risk in agriculture, say uh, to prevent uh, diseases, uh, to build up infrastructure, to uh, you know to cope with drought or flood, and and also to work with market to have more stable uh, <coughs> prices and things like that. But at the same time, to assist farmers to have uh, better cash flow. And I think that insurance uh, system need to be improved as well. OK, you mentioned drought and floods. A, a nice point to jump off into the issue of climate change. I started off by saying this is probably the biggest challenge of all. Uh, and after this, we'll come to the floor for some questions for, for you guys. But let me just throw, I'll throw it out again, just for anybody who wants to pick it up, because I don't know where to begin with the issue of climate change. I mean, it seems that we've only just <coughs> even got to the point where the majority of the world is willing to accept that we need to act. So having got to that point now, how do we act? For the farmer, for the agricultural community, for the challenges that we've been talking about, someone tell me how, you know, what's the issue of climate change here? Well, Everyone wants to go. Let's okay. stop. Okay. okay. Well, I, I think that you know we have a, a pretty clear idea of what's going to be facing us. We know there's going to be floods. We know there's going to be droughts. We know that seawater is going to be intruding. We know that temp nighttime temperatures will increase, all of which adversely affect crop productivity. We also know that within our crop species, there is sufficient resources to, to breed into our plant and animal uh, uh, sources of food to withstand these stresses. It's not something that's done overnight. It can take a decade, it could take 15, 20 years, but the fact is the tools are there and with a bit of ingenuity, we know we can create it. Now the question is, is the framework, the social and policy framework, institutional structures, will they be in place to take full advantage of the potential? So I think that the, the bricks are there, the mortar is there, but the question is, do we have the architects and the, and the patients to build what needs to be built? Let, let's ask the minister. Uh, when uh, I think that uh, climate change is affecting agriculture, affecting us already, uh, and that uh, influence is increasing, and what we should do now the most important now is to make everyone aware and especially to inform farmers, every farmer. And I think the best response is, must be from everyone, not only from the government. And of course, the government has to take action as well. And we need to choose uh, non-regret uh, uh, things and carry it out to assist people to respond to climate change. Is climate change a big conversation point amongst farmers? Yes, of course, we don't term it climate change, but we know that the that unpredictable weather patterns has affected so much our crops and our yields and our harvest. And this is how we see it, because we have discussed this in our, in our association. Uh, agriculture is very much a contributor for climate change, okay? But it's the kind of agriculture that is chemical intensive, that is what we call industrial agriculture. And therefore, the solution will be more sustainable, more environment friendly agriculture. One that protects the environment, but also produces, gives us higher leads so that we can have income. And therefore, we will continue to, to farm and out, we will encourage our children to farm. Okay, but so this is the framework, the kind of agriculture that we think we should go to address uh, climate change. We can adapt to climate change, but we can adapt it through sustainable agriculture approaches, environment friendly ones. And when we do this, then we also help mitigate climate change because these practices also reduces uh, greenhouse gas emissions, which are the main contributor to climate change. Before I throw it open to the floor, please prepare questions if you would and engage with our audience. But let me just give Frankie a word on this yeah. uh, and uh, Sing Chan as well. Frankie, your, your company, rightly or wrongly, is, is very much engaged in this conversation, the use of land and its contribution uh, to the issue of climate change. What, what, what do you see as being the priorities and the issues here? Well, I think uh, sustainable agriculture is the only answer. And, uh, Certainly, how can we really, across the board, do the good agriculture practice? 
uh, that is, uh, is our effort together. Uh, that's why the public uh, private partnership is, is very, very important. But, but earlier on, you broke down your policies into a percentage attribution of importance to various issues. Are you attributing enough of your focus to the issue of climate change? Well, uh, in terms of Indonesia policy itself, um, the, uh, there's no more uh, peatland plantation. That, that's already, we, we already put the uh, policy in place. Uh, no uh, slash and burns. Uh, the, uh, we only plant in those uh, areas which is already degraded land. So these are the, er the things that we're working together with the government and the NGOs uh, to make sure that out of those 188 million spacious planning, how many hectares is for conservation, how many hectares is for uh, vegetation. So all those has to be managed uh, in, the, in the right ways. Okay. And final word to you, Singh Chan, before we sure. go to that. Um, so to us, the climate change, uh, again, it's an emerging issue and it needs to be well defined and then uh, solutions also more structured and defined. But <clears throat> some of the things that we are looking at uh, uh, trying to mitigate would be, as we had mentioned earlier, about 30% of the uh, climate or greenhouse gas is connected to the agriculture sector. So if you can find a way to farm it with more sustainable manner, you can reduce that greenhouse gas emission. Secondly, uh, we, as uh, uh, Dupont, is looking at how we can convert some of the um, waste, bio-waste, and uh, coming from the crop production. Convert that into a fuel and in replacement of the depletable resources. And if we can find a good way to do that, I think it will contribute towards reduction of climate change uh, uh, problems. And specifically, we, ha we are in the process of commercializing a technology called the cellulosic ethanol production technology in the United States. And we hope that this technology can be propagated to other crops uh, in the future where the technology continue to evolve. Okay. So that's on the mitigation side. But just one more thing is on the, on the crop side itself. There are also technologies to enable us to produce crops that are more climate resistant, soil, uh, 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 let's say, flood resistance or uh, uh, drought resistance, uh, or maybe shorter maturity dates so that it can consume less water and less uh, input materials. Uh, fertilizer efficient, for example. Those technologies are actually there, they are being evolved. And if we can really define these needs well, we can actually perfect these technologies and contribute towards that as well. All right. Well, look, we've skimmed uh, the issues. Uh, no more. Touched on the surface of a lot of things here. But I'm sure there's plenty of people here who have different questions. Please. Yeah, I'm Let's go to grab a microphone there. And, uh... Uh, my name is Tiskun from Cambodia Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fishery. I um, have been inspired by this uh, panel to hear about the uh, agriculture transformation in East Asia. As transformation have been made, uh, I think, um, fundamentally from the changing uh, or transforming the people, how to make the people change. Uh, as we could not just simply tell the people misuse the resource or not use the resource, but uh, how to use the resource wisely and uh, by uh, inspire them to change the way how they think, how they act, and how they behave. And uh, from the previous, from yesterday, uh, Grow Asia Agriculture Forum. I have heard a lot about the resource, about the knowledge uh, available, but how to transfer uh, this resource to our target group, I mean the uh, farmer. So therefore, um, farmer capacity, I would like to emphasize this, uh, the fundamental key for the future change. That's that a, key, one a, a key question that we yeah. actually tried to address in yeah. terms of that yeah. relationship between the farming sure. community and and, uh, and, and the from our the, from our the experience uh, implementing the proper policy in Cambodia for the last uh, decade, uh, mm. we have uh, learned that we could not just simply enrich people's life, 
just uh, ensuring their land tenure or resource access, but also how to uh, inspire them, the self-help initiatives and support to the innovative uh, <laughs> capacity continuously in the crowd. I would like to hear that from them. Thank you very much for your contribution. Well, yeah, I, th I think mm. the secretary makes a, a, a really, really important point, and, and that is it, it, that for people to take up a new technology, it's going to be in their, it's going to have to be in their self-interest, whether we like it or not, and and they're going to have to perceive an interest, and it's going to have to be something that benefits them in their realm of experience. It, if we talk about sea level rise 150 years from now, or we talk about our great-great-grandchildren are going to resent us, quite frankly, that's not going to impact on the decisions we make today. If we know that the decisions we make will improve our livelihoods, will improve the environment that we're living in and we experience every day, then I think we will, will, will move forward. But until we're able to translate the, the challenges of, of climate change the, the impact of it and the difference that we as individuals can make and how those benefits will, we will experience as well as the broader society and environment will experience, we're not going to get very far. But I think we can do that. Let's take another question. <clears throat> Hi. Um, John Pang from NYU Stern. Um, the, the panel actually uh, began uh, a, a, with a good summary of um, the extent of the demand for food uh, that, that we face in, in coming uh, decades, right? And one part of the answer, which um, I'd love to see you ad address, is the role of trade in this. Now, the food sector is notoriously one of the most, um, ag agriculture in particular <coughs> food, is one of the most protected sectors, right? In ASEAN, for example, there is no rice market. And each country protects that, that, that market quite, quite, quite strongly. Uh, in food production, for example, last year, I think Indonesia imposed a, a, a ban on the export of, of food. I'm not sure that helped the farmers. And in total, I'm not sure this is helping you know, such policies uh, which, are sort of, which have the aim, the, the, sort of a good aim of uh, ensuring food security. I'm not sure they help total agricultural output across the region. Mm -hmm. So we need to address food security in total we clearly need rational, economic rationalization of production across the region. I'd love to hear the panel speak mm -hmm. to this point. Thank well, you. Let's put it to the minister, if we could, for a second, sure. because the, the government aspect of this is very important. Are, are your trade policies supporting or hindering food security? Uh, when uh, in Vietnam we believe in uh, free trade, and open door policy have Vietnam agriculture develop uh, sustainably for last three decades, including uh, food production. Uh, and now, now they uh, say Vietnam is exporting uh, country. So clearly, in order to have farmer to have enough income to continue to produce more rice, we need to have more market. Uh, so that's why, from Vietnam perspective, we, we always uh, support uh, more free trade. Okay. Frank, yeah, I mean, you're not the Indonesian government minister, but can you speak to the idea of, of these policies that the questioner mentioned? Yeah. Um, in the 2010, uh, I launched a food security summit, uh, so-called Feed the World. And our president uh, changed the name, so-called Fit Indonesia and Fit the World. <laughs> so, so what it means that certainly uh, we need to take care of our, society, of our people first. But it doesn't mean that we, sh we, we, we didn't care for the rest. So what it means that food security, of course, every country will take care of their own citizen. But how, what we are talking here is how can we, through our, the potential of what we have, uh, which we can see Indonesia has big, big potential because most of the yield of our uh, smallholders farmer are very, very low. And the wastage that we are talking about, the transportation of uh, uh, the horticultural loss in transportation is about 60%. So if we can save all those things, we're able to help our neighboring country. So 
certainly uh, we would like to promote the Asian, because the Asian community is coming next year. So this, uh, the, the Grow Asia, the purpose is for that also. But how can we, in each of our country, really enhance the potential of all those uh, 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 yield that we can, we can come up? Then we can talk about how we can exchange. Other comments? I, I just uh, very quickly, I think that uh, uh, it is very difficult to um, change national policy across, across the countries, and we have to recognize that. But it is, when we talk about free trade, we're talking about possibly taking care of the national policy going beyond that, how we can get the, get the trade to be more freer. Uh, and that has the effect of increasing production because it allows the countries to optimize the kinds of crops that they produce. For example, Indonesia and Malaysia produces palm, and this palm probably not going to be optimized in production up in, let's say, Myanmar or even northern Thailand because just the climate and the soil conditions. So it is important for countries to, to allow some of that trade so that we can actually maximize their competitive advantage. Okay. Good. Okay, sorry, Estrella Kogan. Yeah, I, I like what I heard. Feed the Indonesia, then feed the world. And I think each country could, could have that kind of slogan. For, for us farmers, what we want for our country and ASEAN countries is to be caring, to be a caring society for farmers because the farmers are one of the most uh, one of the most uh, uh, sector, uh, majority of the sector in, in the country. So we have experience in free trade, okay? So we know that there are winners and losers in free trade. In the Philippines, for example, our onion farmers, our garlic farmers have been losers in this free trade. So we want our country, our government to care for us and to protect us and to see how we can win and how we can compete. There is a whole deeper conversation to this one, but we want to get Real some more quick, questions in. Yeah, just very quick, I want to come back. I think, and this is a heter heretical comment, but I think that we need a, 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 a commodities exchange, particularly a rice futures market. We've been, Erie, we've been trying to work on that for about five years, and we were basically equated with the great Satan. Why would you want to have a, a futures market? You're going to get speculators in. But the, the problem is there's no way for the farmers to hedge their harvest to, 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 to secure their, covering their cost. And I think we need to have a regional discussion on developing a rational rice exchange that would have a futures compo a component, you would have contracts exchange. And we get that, then the farmers, well actually, if they can participate in it, can actually be big gainers and, 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 and stabilize their, their financial environment. Thank you. Price the question of the yeah, exactly. Good morning, I'm Ed Francisco from BDO, a Philippine bank. I, I, I just wanted to go back to basics and I think you were addressing it. Because he, here in the Philippines, we have a requirement to lend 20% to agriculture and, and agrarian reform. And yet, most of the banks do not comply. We even pay the fines because we are afraid to lend to the farmers. It's mm -hmm. bad. It's, so so I, my question is to the panel. <coughs> Is there something we can learn from the rest of the countries or is there something that the WEF can do to make it easier for the banks to lend? We have so much liquidity here and then yet we don't lend to the farmers because the, the, the risks are too high. So, so what are the solutions maybe? Thank you. Thoughts? Well, this is exactly uh, where uh, the, 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 the PISA Agro, the, part, the Partnership of Sustainable Agriculture in Indonesia that we have launched. Uh, addressing those issues. So, uh, the number one, we need to give this farmer collectively through the cooperative a good agriculture practice so that the yield will go up. Then, after the yield goes up, then we can deduct the money to pay the banks. So, this is a very simple theory. And, but how to do that? I think that is what we need to sit down as a working group and addressing all those issues together. Uh, so uh, in case of palm oil, Indonesia has been very successful because of that, uh, thanks to World Bank support during the 80s, and now we are number one in the world. Okay, another question. Over here. <laughs> Lots of questions. 
Hi there. I'm Sam Johnson from the Global Shaper from the Christchurch Hub in New Zealand. Uh, I'm from a farm. I'm from a crop farm there. And um, over the last 10 years, pretty much all around us has been converted to dairy farms. I just wanted the panel's view on what you <coughs> see the agriculture industries from Australia and New Zealand uh, contributing to Asia in the next 20 to 50 years uh, and where you would like to see our priorities. Uh, our government's very much focused on milk exports. Uh, and I just wonder what, where, where, from the perspective here, you'd see the priorities laying. Anyone in particular you want to address the question to? Uh, not just necessarily. Anyone care to talk about priorities here? Minister, from, I mean, what, what, how, how do you determine the, 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 the shape of that market? From Australia. New Zealand. New Zealand. Uh, uh, when, uh, in the uh, case of uh, Vietnam, say, dairy uh, production is uh, devel developing uh, fast, but we uh, are be able to provide only 30% of the demand in the country by ourselves. Uh, that's why we are importing uh, milk and milk powder from Australia, New Zealand, and as well as cows, so that we could raise here. So I think uh, we we can, uh, we hope that uh, we can share experiences to assist farmers uh, in Vietnam to produce uh, more uh, milk, but at the same time, we will maintain a trade uh, between Vietnam and Australia and New Zealand uh, in terms of uh, milk, for okay. example. And uh, we hope that uh, both uh, uh, two countries uh, are uh, kind, you know, in supporting also uh, continue to support more trade uh, with, uh, among our uh, countries. Thank you. Over here. Hi, I'm Cherry Atelano from Manila Hub, a social entrepreneur as well of Gawad Kalinga Enchanted Farm Village University in the Philippines. Uh, my question is, how can we inclusively include the farmers in the value chain? Because most of the time, big corporations are just dealing with the traders. And of course, these traders, we don't know how much they're getting it from the farmer themselves. Because considering the Philippines, there are like three to five layers of traders. So how can we reinforce it? Is it the business people to reinforce it or the government? Or how can or, we facilitate or it? Or the farmers themselves. I mean, let's try the first, uh, the first response or will be from the farmers' organizations will be to build our capabilities to to be to participate more in the value chain, okay? To do processing, for example, of our products, and then link to to to, to those who are who are into it. Okay, so it needs a lot of study, uh, lots of analysis and lots of capacity building. But farmers' organizations can play a role in partnership with the private sector and, of course, with the enabling policy from the government. Other thoughts? My thought is that in, in, uh, in the value chain, in fact, uh, every component of, of the value chain has its own value add. The key is to allow the information flow so that the value add is appropriately appropriately compensated. So a trader is getting, uh, in your uh, implication, uh, high, higher than the uh, fair profit because the information is not available to the farmers and so on and so forth. So if we are able to, through knowledge base, through communication, to improve the value, uh, the information flow through the value chain, it will, it will make it a lot more efficient. Uh, in uh, Vietnam, for the last four years, and the uh, World Economic Forum sponsorship. Uh, the government is working with uh, 15 international corporations uh, uh, on uh, public-private partnership uh, scheme. Uh, we uh, working uh, together to assist farmers and get them involved in value change. And I see uh, reasons are very good uh, we were able to uh, increase income of farmers uh, and assist them to increase productivity. And uh, at the same time, we also achieve a reduction of emission. Uh, so PPP, what we are 
talking these days uh, in this forum is very good model for future. Mm. I think so. Time for a couple more questions. Gentlemen over here. Hello, my name is Yuito Yamada from um, the Tokyo Global Shapers. I wanted to ask you a question, how to make agricultural business sustainable here in the Philippines. Um, I know that um, in the Philippines, the rice costs are, the rice prices is about a dollar per kilo. When we compare and benchmark that with some others like Cambodia and Thailand, it's almost like 50% below the price. So as like free trade like expands and maybe also the ASEAN integration happening up very soon um, in 2015 as well, lots of the businesses in the Philippines would be swiped as well. I wanted to kind of hear your perspective on how to make this sustainable here in the Philippines. Any thoughts? Can you repeat the question? It's not very clear. This is, <laughs> <laughs> the essence of your question is how to improve sustainability options oh, in the Philippines. Oh, so, nice. Sorry, say again. Especially when ASEAN integration happens. With ASEAN integration as, a, mm. as an ancillary the sustainability thing. Of? Well, I mean, he mentioned, he mentioned the rice situation. I mean, yeah. well, I, I think it, that's a that's a a, a very very uh, it's a very good question, and it, it enters into the the realm of technology politics uh, interface. And and as we've heard from others, rice is a strategic commodity. It is a political commodity. It's been the prices are distorted. The trade is distorted. It's opaque. All of these uh, all of these conspire to make for uh, a very um, distorted rice price. Now, as if, if ASEAN does open up its rice, rice, rice trade, what will have to happen first is that there is a level playing field, that the, that the policies that allow farmers to, to produce their rice crop, whatever subsidies, what have you, that, that, the, that those farmers, that there are not farmers who are benefiting through uh, uh, closeted subsidies, and it therefore can, the, 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 their rice can enter into a global trade at a much lower price, which is effectively a subsidized price. I think what we need first to get is, is, is transparent policies so that the prices can be compared favorably. And then the, the efficiencies of different production areas that, that, that were talked about earlier could then be balanced. I think that's going to be, and until we get the policies in place that are transparent, such that the true, cro true costs of production can be relate, related to the cost of sale, or the price at the point of sale, then we can get a balance. But until we have that transparency, it's going to be recriminations, it's going to be closet subsidies, and we're going to have problems for the foreseeable future. Quick one, then man of the front. Hello, I'm Gibran, uh, Global Shapers Community from Bandung Hub, Indonesia. Uh, I, I want to give one opinion and one question. Make it very quick, please. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe just one opinion for perspective for, for young, young, men, young people. Uh, one of the problems in agriculture is the poor engagement of young people in agriculture. Uh, in, in my opinion, the, the reason is because the, the being farmers is not cool. I'm a farmer, and I, I started a company in agriculture engineering. One of our products is e-fishery. If fishery is automatic feeder then can, that can sense that can sense the fish appetite and connect it to the internet. So when you when you see a young man uh, play with with his tablet, what are you doing? I'm controlling my uh, fish farmer. How can you do that? Because I have automatic feeder that can sense the fish appetite, and that is cool. I think that is what uh, farmers need: the more soft, so, uh, affordable sophistication. And it's not on, on, it's not just about cool features, but it is about, it can reduce the 21% cost of feeding and it can reduce, it, it can uh, prevent the overfeeding that can, uh, can pra uh, practice environmental friendly. And that is uh, the, the, one of the solution in agriculture from the perspective of young people. Mm -hmm. but, okay. uh, can, I, can I ask one question? Uh, very, very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> from Mr. Rujaya. In, in Indonesia, I see that uh, the two sectors that contradict in, in Indonesia is, uh, uh, property development and agriculture. And Sinarman has, has Sinarman's land and Sinarman's agriculture. So when we build, uh, we create the buildings, we re lost our agricultural land. How you as the private sector in ag agriculture and property development see this and how a a government in Indonesia, the policy, uh, uh, make the environment stable. Thank you. 
Very good question. So, uh, as you know, Indonesia, we have 188 million hectares. So, we, I think the government is trying to do uh, one map. Now we have three maps. One is uh, in the central government, one is in the, uh, in the uh, uh, Department of uh, uh, Forestry, and one is in the, in the region. So we try to map, mapping this to, into one map and then really do the spacious planning. Which one is for urban development and which one is for agriculture uh, uh, development and which one we have to conserve because really climate change is a, is a big issue today. So these are the things that I think uh, the government is uh, uh, fi finalizing all those maps. And certainly we have to, uh, in terms of the agriculture product, we have discussed a lot how to make it sustainable, how to use good, uh, good technology to make sure that the, the carbon uh, emission is less, uh, capturing all the methane, let's say, in, in, uh, in palm oil sector. So the, we will capture all the methane uh, from that, become electricity, by 2015, so basically no, no more methane some emission there. So all those kind of things is improving. So, so I think uh, that, that hopefully answer your question. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have run out of time. I'd like to ask you to join me in appreciating our panel here today. Robert Ziegler, Hussein Chan, thank you for our media, and Mr. Paldo And thank you very much indeed for being here. I'm sure you can have a chat with our panel after this as well. So please engage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.